Doug Stark, I'm um, Senior Director of Software at the JBoss Division of Red Hat, and today I want to talk about our supersonic Eclipse microprofile runtime. So there's two components to that, and just as if you, FYI, if you have the application, you can read and talk after that at the end. The first piece is our Quarkus runtime, and Quarkus is our initiative to in, to reintroduce cloud native to the cloud native Java. The key features of Quarkus are along three different dimensions. The first is we're really focused on the developer experience. What we want to do is take your existing uh, runtimes that you're familiar with, all, all, all the Java Enterprise libraries, all the standard open source libraries, and we'll take a look at some of them that we have, and make that a really good experience both from your desktop experience as well as the cloud, development in the cloud, and against the, the cloud. The other two pieces that we're trying to merge are imperative and reactive APIs, which are at times at odds, and being able to scale from serverless functions to you know, full-blown microservices, as fat as you want them. Um, we produce either fat jars, which actually you'll see are, are slimmed down relative to your traditional flat, fat jar, or a native, a native image, which is very, very lean. The, the goal being we're optimizing for the cloud in terms of memory usage, startup time for, again, uh, serverless functions to microservices in and, and a Kubernetes native fashion. So uh, this is a small sampling of the libraries that we're working with and integrating into Quarkus to enable these at the native level. Vertex, Hibernate, RESTEasy, Camel, um, Netty, MicroProfile, Kubernetes, OpenShift. Jaeger, Prometheus, Kafka, in, InfiniSpan, and we probably have another 30 libraries that are part of the Quarkus family at this point. So what does it mean to be a, a native or a Quarkus extension? What does, it, what does it take to take a framework and make that cloud native? There's, there's a number of pieces. The first is you have to think about your your feature set as a deployable content that has a build phase distinct from runtime phase. So traditionally in Java what we have is reflection and configuration that happens during startup and then we have a running phase. So one of the key things that we do with the Quarkus framework is we separate those and introduce a contract that um, clearly defines metadata and configuration versus your runtime behavior. The point being that allows us to segment out those behaviors and even those dependencies and those startup costs from our native image. So that's one of the key things. And one of the nice things about how we do that is it allows for a, a relatively easy on-ramp because you can go from, eh, I don't really want to get into all these details about what, what reflection capabilities I do or don't want to, to deal with, um, what configuration I want to extract. Because oftentimes, you know, you have fixed APIs that are consuming a YAML file, an XML file, a JSON file, or a configuration object, and you know you just don't have the time at this at right now as you're doing an investigation to pull that stuff out. So you can you can approach it um, as you want. The, you, you, what you're going to see is less benefit from the startup cost and more memory overhead because you've included stuff that you could potentially pull out during the build phase. But you know that's up to you. That's a benefit. You don't have to go all the way. And so the, the Quarkus build process is a, a set of Maven plugins uh, that, and, and, and annotation compilers that go from your traditional compile phase. We look at what frameworks you're using, what annotations you're using, what feature sets you're using, what configuration files you're using, and that, that's the, the, every, every single extension, that's its job, is to look at what's being used and figure out how to best map that onto the Grail VM or even the Java VM, there's there's a benefit even in, in pure Java mode for this this analysis, and what we and then that produces basically a dependency graph with all the feature sets identified, the configuration identified, and then we from that we can produce either a relatively lean fat jar, so it's slim down fat jar, or go through the that um, ahead of time compilation and produce a native image that's incredibly light, tight. And the architecture that, that allows this is illustrated in this diagram. So basically, we, we, 
the, the bottom of this slide is actually at the right of the previous slide. So you have a target, which is either hotspot or the grail, VM, native image, um, runtime, which is substrate currently. On top of that, we, we generate, as part of the dependency analysis, a Jandex index, which is our um, annotation and class metadata that allows you to do reflection and uh, an out code analysis without actually loading code through a, through a class loader. So it basically is a cache of all that information, allows you to quickly um, analyze for feature sets relative to your um, extension. So for example, a Hibernate thing is looking at the, the JPA annotations, the, the JAXRS layers looking at the JAXRS REST endpoint annotations. Gizmo is a framework built on top of the Object Web ASM library to simplify some of the, the bytecode rating tasks because you know, if you've ever written uh, bytecode through the ASM library, it's a pain in the butt. Um, so this gives you a higher level view of the types of things that you need to do as uh, an extension writer. But that, that's pretty high level, I mean, that's pretty low level details. I mean, typically very few of our extensions require that level of analysis, but if you do, you have that, that capability. Then there's integration with the Grail SDK, which basically is the, the low level substrate APIs that are doing things like class replacement, um, registering classes for reflection, um, and, and that, that type of thing. We have a custom implementation of CDI um, called Weld Arc that throws out some of the runtime behavior, some of the, the dynamicity that um, CDI has. So for example, CDI has portable extensions which basically allow super crazy runtime uh, analysis and querying of your beans to try and figure out patterns. But that's super expensive. That A lot of those, those things require APIs that Grail doesn't, the, the, the native substrate VM doesn't support. So there are certain limitations on what you can do in a runtime. So for example, there's no dynamic class loading, things like that. Um, then the Quarkus core is, is really the, the place where we define the configuration aspects, um, the, the, the abstractions for how an extension needs to present its metadata and consume metadata, expose its dependencies, expose uh, its features relative to other extensions. So there's a big interaction between extensions. So, you know, the core is, is JAXRS, CDI, and on top of that, you build and, so, so for example, I can have an extension that is augmenting the JAXRS container by emitting what we call build steps or features, feature sets that describe behaviors that normally I would have had to, to configure, you know, with some uh, JAXRS uh, custom provider configuration. So there's an interaction and dependency chain that, that comes out from all these extensions that both allow for a very nice layering so you can come in and replace you know the hibernate layer with your own um, JPA layer just by replacing those the extension and produce the same build features but then it also allows us to determine what is actually used because you have a dependency chain that is only going to have in t in typically a subset of what you normally would have in the, uh, an application, for example, that's exercising every feature of JPA or every feature of JAXRS. And what, what allows us to do is then eliminate that code in the native image. So that's how we get to a super tight native image. It also can uh, eliminate code even in the JVM for a, uh, uh, target. So what does that actually mean? I mean, what are, what are we talking about in terms of sizes? So here's an example of two, two applications, two microservices. One is just a strictly REST-based endpoint that handles uh, you know, an HTTP request. The other is a REST endpoint on top of a, uh, a JPA application. So we're actually going out to a database and pulling that in. And what we're showing are three different levels of um, three different levels of optimization. So the red is your traditional cloud native stack, which is some, uh, you know, JPA or some fat jar based uh, abstraction that can be um, Spring Boot or Thorntail or something like that. The next layer is Quarkus on top of OpenJDK. So it is a Java VM based executable or uh, fat jar, but uh, you can see that we'll go through these numbers that we've slimmed it down. And the, the white is the actual native image. So we'll look at these blown up. So the first comparison is the resonance stack size of these three options. So for a REST application, in this particular case, I think we're using like Spring Boot 4. Um, that came weighed in at 140 megabytes. Our Quarkus fat jar, 
came in at 74 megabytes. And the, so why is that different? The reason it's different is that we pulled out all of the configuration files that are necessary for parsing the annotations, the JAXRS annotations, parsing the JAXRS configuration, and, and those type of things, because we don't need those at runtime, it's a one-time thing. Then the next is the native image. So the na native image is you know, an order of magnitude smaller than your traditional fat jar. So now if we add in JPA, the, the traditional jar is up to 218K. The, uh, our OpenJDK version of Quarkus is 130 megabytes, so roughly a little, a little more than half. And the native image is, is up to 35 megabytes, but still you know, a factor of seven. Not quite, not, not quite as good as an order of magnitude because you do have a lot of you know, resident classes that do have to remain around for the JPA functionality, but still close to an order of magnitude and difference. So in terms of startup times, um, just the simple REST application with a, a handling to the first response was four seconds. The Quarkus, this is actually an interesting one, the Quarkus, it's still on the JVM, is still significantly faster. And why, again, why is that? The reason being, we're not doing annotation processing, we're not doing configuration parsing. You know, we're just getting to, we we pulled your configuration that was already um, defined at build time into the running image from classes that we've generated with bytecode to provide very fast start time, and then with the native image, we're, we're super fast, down to 0 0.101 seconds. When we add JPA, we're still seeing significant advantages between uh, your traditional fat jar, the open JDK one, and then the native image. So this is what is, is going to allow us to start getting back to using Java for ser even serverless functions. You know, the overhead for this is on the order um, in terms of startup time and memory as even what you would see with a Go application. And certainly it's better than your, your typical Node.js application. So that's the, first, that's the first piece, that's the Quarkus runtime container that does the cloud native piece. Um, if you're interested in that, if you're interested in learning more about how we do that, you can go to the, the website and take a look at the numerous uh, quick start projects that we have across all the typical feature sets. You know, those, those 10 I showed are only a fraction of what we have so far. Um, we have a number of extensions and it's growing daily, so you can take a look at what those extensions are, what, it, what they do, what it takes to be an extension, and then links to our developer uh, and uh, community resources. And as uh, Java Duke Twain here says, the reports of my death in the cloud are greatly exaggerated because of uh, projects like um, Quarkus that are building upon the Grail VM and, and others. So I think Java still has a, a bright future in the cloud. The second part of this talk is about the, the Eclipse MicroProfile feature set. So Eclipse MicroProfile is targeted at bringing enterprise Java developers into the microservice and cloud development environments. And so here we're going to go over a few of the, um, the capabilities that we have in the 2.2 release. So what is, if you haven't heard of MicroProfile before, it's, it's a community of developers, vendors, and, or, and individuals that are part of the Eclipse Foundation that are finding specifications to basically introduce um, uh, enterprise developers or bring enterprise developers into the cloud. So we have several traditional Java enterprise Java vendors, influential user groups like London Java Community, So Java, and even surprising vendors like Microsoft. You you may not have thought of them as a big Java and Java EE vendor, but they are actually are a pretty heavy Java shop and certainly are obviously big into the cloud, so they are involved in this initiative. So the, what, it, what MicroProfile does is basically define sets of specifications that define interoperability and APIs um, starting from a core layer. So we start with four Enterprise Java foundational APIs, CDI, JSONP, JAXRS, and JSONB. And then on top of that, we define uh, APIs for other feature sets that we, we believe are interesting for microservice developers in the cloud. So it's the, the rest of this talk, we're going to talk about these, these eight feature sets, fault tolerance, metrics, JWT propagation, health check, config, 
REST client, open tracing, and open API, and what those are. So we'll start with configuration because it's, it's one of the more foundational specifications and it's heavily used across all of the, the microprofile specifications. What it does is define an SPI and CDI behaviors for externalizing configuration information into string-based um, stores, which we call uh, configuration sources. We define three base configuration sources that every implementation has to support, and those are based on integration environment variables, system properties, and then a specific microprofile config.properties file. The SPI allows for you to define your own custom configuration sources to integrate your own stream-based metadata. So, for example, I can define a, con a config map base source for you know, Kubernetes or OpenShift environments that have those, that type of sources. Obviously, YAML, GDBC, etc. So, it, there's a relatively simple API to implement to have any type of string value mapping configuration system. It has a pretty extensible API for in the injection and um, both programmatically and via CDI injection. You can define your own custom types. So for you can have um, you know injection of internet addresses, uh, whatever Arbit arbitrarily complex types. You can define how you map those from a string to the injection point. So a, a simple example of illustrates your, your, your typical use cases that you have. Uh, a JAX or S endpoint annotated with this configuration property annotation. And then you give it a name for the configuration property that's been externalized. You can have defaultable values. So here we're injection of some pi value to five decimals. If it, if you don't, so if you don't have a default value and this isn't an optional, this you can inject an optional type if you don't have a requirement. But if you have it defined as this. That means that value has to be defined and a configuration property or it's going to be a runtime exception. So CDI will take care of this and then we're just showing the usage of it in the, the REST endpoints. A programmatic example is shown here where we're looking up the current configuration object and then looking up a value and, and specifying the type that it should be cast to. And so there is, as I said, there is uh, an SPI that allows you to, to map from string values to arbitrarily complex types. And, and the configuration, uh, out of the box, there's support for many standard uh, string to value types. So here's, here's an example of what the, the default uh, configuration property file looks like, where you just give, again, your standard job properties file, name value pairs. Those are the, the three values that we reference in, in that example. So here we've overridden the default value of injected pi from five decimals to 10 decimals. We'll see in the demo that that is hopefully read correctly. Okay, the next specification is Open API. Open API is basically a mapping of the language agnostic Open API version three specification for describing a collection of endpoints or REST endpoint metadata into the job space and particularly following the conventions of the, the micro profile focusing on CDI and um, annotation based programming. So by default, you don't actually need to do anything to generate an open API documentation or a set of um, a description of your, your JEX or S endpoints and we'll see that in, a, in a, uh, the, the demonstration. So you, you, only tip, you only need to use the annotations if you want to augment that information. Um, and there's a number of levels of, of your ability to customize that information. Now, Corcus has a number of development modes, so we have a mode where we're running, um, typically as a developer would run on his desktop for his, his fundamental development, and when we're running in that mode, we actually have integration with the Swagger UI, so you can immediately see what your endpoints look like without having to do anything, or look at to look at what your customization has done to it, and we'll see that in the demo as well. So an example of using those, those annotations to augment uh, a JAXRS application is shown here where we have this open API definition annotation and we're adding information, version, contact information for the Quarkus community, email list, homepage, license. Oh, I have actually more information in, in, in the demo, we'll see that. 
Uh, you can add things like super server URLs, external links to documentation, etc. The, the Open API annotation set's actually immense, quite immense, but fortunately you don't have to deal with most of it. So that's the application level thing. If we drop down to an endpoint level, here we're specifying a tag for time, then time service method, so it's a classification tool. Here's an, an external documentation to some external website and then a summary and description of the operation. And we'll see in the Swagger UI that those are the values that are manifested in the API description. Um, okay, next is open tracing. So open tracing is similar to open API. It's, it's an, a language agnostic definition of how you, you track REST endpoints in a, in a service mesh. The, the, the MP open tracing uh, effort is a mapping in of those standards into Java and providing annotations that allow you to customize the, the tracing information that's emitted. So again, by default, you don't need to do anything automatically. All of your JAXRS endpoints are traced and sent to a Jager uh, instance, for example, based on the configuration that's, that's set up with the microprofile parameters. And then we have annotations that allow you to, to fine tune how that trace information is identified. And you can even inject the open tracing uh, endpoint to how uh, intra business method, method or intra uh, rest endpoint spans, for example, if you want more fine grained definitions of how your, your endpoints are behaving. And so a simple example here is where we're, in the first case, customizing how. The, the operation is going to show up in a Jaeger console. So here's the name that we'll provide for that. And here we're excluding an endpoint from being traced. So by default, everything is traced. So this is a mechanism if you have endpoints that you don't want to be sh have showing up in traces, that you would use that simple annotation to accomplish that. So health check is the other, an another fundamental component in service mesh environments where you know, typically Kubernetes or OpenShift environments are probing your container for basic liveness and responsiveness, and if it's not responding well, it will fail it and restart it in hopes that it will recover. So the MP Health Check defines two levels of information around that concept. The first is it provides a basic probe of the HTTP, uh, of status that would be reported via HTTP 200 or, uh, you know, for success or some other one for failure but also defines a mechanism for generating a JSON payload to give you additional information about the state of your health check. So most service environment, or most cloud environments don't look at that, but it is super uh, valuable for DevOps. So if a, a service is failing, they can go out and probe the health endpoint and find out information that developers provided about that. And we'll actually see that in, a good example of that in the, the demo. So how do you implement a health check endpoint? You annotate your AJAXRS endpoint with the health annotation, and then you implement this health check callback. And that is this callback here, where you're returning a health check response. That is that is generated from a builder that has a named um, a name value. And so basically, what happens when you query the high, the, the top level? Um, endpoint for the health check, you get a collection of these individual health checks. So by name and then each, each named health check element has a payload describing the status or information about that health check. So in this case it's, it's some pseudo disk check operation where we're going out and checking a path um, that was based on a, a configuration value that we, use, that we injected via the microprofile config. This is, again, another common feature of the microprofile specs is that they build upon each other and reuse you know, things as, you, as, as it makes sense. And as I said, microprofile config is one of the most pervasive specifications because every other one references it for these externalizable information points. So next is metrics. That's basically analog to health is, you know, okay, fine, it's up, but now what is actually happening in the application? So the metrics uh, specification adds um, a number of required, well, it has basically three levels. You have a base level that is giving basic information about the runtime that you expect from any, um, any runtime environment. Uh, 
They allow for a vendor specific set of specifications that would just be specific to a particular runtime. Um, and then we have application level specifications, which are uh, metrics that you define as relevant to your application using annotations that are defined by the specification. And the types that we support there are counted, gauge, metered, histogram, and timed metrics. The specification all defi also defines how you emit those or obtain those metrics from its endpoints in both JSON and Prometheus text-based um, formats, so you can integrate with your cloud environment monitoring tools. And so an example of a application-specific set of metrics is illustrated here where we're injecting a metric of type counter, and it's an endpoint counter. We've added a timed metric on this, this method, so that's going to basically generate a, uh, a timed histogram, historical view of the operation of this method. And then we have a gauge method on this counter, which is actually used by other methods. And a gauge is basically a, um, a single value thing, that, uh, a single value that, that is monitored over time. Okay, fault tolerance is um, another feature that you need in microservice meshes because as soon as you start splitting services out, you start having issues with, you know, uh, inconsistencies of availability and network failures and you know the, the usual so it's fine there are development benefits to going to the microservice pattern but there's also but th that comes at the cost of operational problems so fault tolerant mechanisms are are there to both control how requests are um, collated and what you do when, when failures happen. And what we have here is a, just a simple example of, of the fallback feature. So this REST endpoint is annotated with a fallback method and a timeout. So what this says is that if this endpoint doesn't respond within 500 milliseconds, then execute this fallback code and return that instead. That's a common pattern that Hystrix and other of fault tolerant features uh, provide. I mean, this is this is one of the probably this is one of the few microprofile specs that can potentially be completely superseded by a, a mesh environment. So technologies like Istio, for example, provide provide a lot of these same features. So there's a little bit of an overlap between uh, you know what you actually want a developer doing versus what you want configured in a DevOps layer like an Istio service mesh. You know, we we'll have to. I mean, that's one of the things we, we keep watching as, as the microprofile specs evolve is, you know, what is, the proper, um, what is the proper set of APIs that we should be exposing to the developer versus, you know, leaving in the hands of the DevOps. And as we gain more experience with Istio and service mesh type environments, you know, I, I think this is, you know, one of our specs that potentially will we'll need to evolve. The next one is a REST client. Um, Specification and basically this is a standardization of what many JAXRS frameworks have done for a long time, namely provide a type safe uh, proxy for a set of for a collection of endpoint functionality, and it provides both uh, the ability to inject that type safe interface as well as a programmatic ability to to build up and uh, define uh, customization of that. And the key thing is that this integrates with all of the other features and APIs that already exist. So for example, JAXRS has a lot of uh, provider and customization filters, mapping and all that type of stuff that you don't have, are not thrown out just because you're using a type safe proxy. Those integrate as you would expect. Same with the other specifications that we've defined. So fault tolerance, tracing and metrics do the right thing when you use those annotations on the rest of the, the type safe, the rest, the, the micro profile rest client API. You know, if you have tracing and I call out to a type proxy, that tracing information that I defined on the interface is going to be propagated on that. If I have security, then the security headers are going to be propagated. So how do you use this API? Well, the first thing is you define what your type safe interface is. So here, and then you use this annotation to, to define that. This is, can be used as a default. This can also be overridden by a, a micro profile configuration value as well. And I define an interface that has the, the representation of the JAXRS 
endpoints that I would expect that I want from my type safe proxy. Okay, so in this case, I have the path, the, the type, and then I'm returning a now object. Now, how do I actually use that? Well, in a, in a, a, now in a JAXRS service, I, actually just, I inject that endpoint that wants to consume that service. So here, I have another JAXRS endpoint, and I use the REST client uh, annotation to inject this world clock API. That's the API that defined, the interface that defined the previous slide. So now in this method, the, my JAXRS endpoint now, I'm using the type safe proxy to go and make that query and return that object. And we'll look at some, some of this in the demo as well. So the last one we're going to look at is the microprofile JWT propagation uh, standard. So typically, you, when you're writing microservices, they're serverless. And we need, so then we need to propagate or define the security context for authentication and authorization as a, as a part of the payload for the request. And a popular, uh, popular set of standards based on JSON Web Tokens, uh, starting at the 7519 RFC, that references a number of other ones, is, is what we base the microprofile uh, JWT propagation spec on. And what we basically, so those specifications just define a lot of what ifs, a lot of attributes, a lot of claims, a lot of uh, standards, um, a lot of ways that you could do things, but there is no interoperability concern there. So basically that was the focus of the specification, is to lock down some of the, the ways that you could use these tokens such that you can actually obtain interoperability between microprofile containers. So what we did do is define a bare authentication scheme that requires the RS-256 sign tokens, so that's a JWS. We added a new claim that defines a collection of roles called groups that we that, you, that can also use for um, role-based authorization, similar to what you would see in enterprise Java standards, where you have the um, the security, uh, the common security annotation <laughs> annotations like roles allowed, etc. And actually, we we leverage those same annotations for the same purpose as well. Then we integrate with those container APIs by defining a, an interface for the token that's an extension of the Java security principle interface, and then we allow for injection or lookup of the individual claims on the, on the token as part of, uh, as part of your, your endpoint. So for example, a simple endpoint that is using security and needs access to the token would inject it via that interface. Um, here we're injecting a particular UPN claim from that token. This is the JAXRS security context. So here we're, we're showing that the, the JWT authentication scheme integrates with that. So when I call this, I'll see, I'll, I'll see the, the microprofile authorization scheme. Here I'm making a call to that programmatic is a user in a role. That, is gonna, that maps back to the group's claim that was added to the token. Okay. And then we're looking at um, the, the username. So get name, that's the principal name. Again, that will map back to one of several uh, standard claims. The, the, the preferred username, the subject, or the UPN. There's a hierarchy of claims that define how that user is represented um, uh, in your application for potentially other lookups. I mean, here's another example where we're using a custom claim. Um, in this case, zone info that we've added. So we have to, we're going to use key cloak to define as our identity provider and, and uh, JWT source. And there we've set up users with, uh, in addition to the standard uh, RFC uh, 7519 claims, you have the ability to add arbitrary claims as well. So what we've done here is define a zone info for a time zone. We're going to use that as basically uh, a service that layers on top of that public world clock API, which returns time and universal time coordinates. So we're going to charge people if they want the time in their own time zone, and we're going to base that upon the token information, as an example. And again, here, so when we secure, this is a secured method that requires a world clock subscriber to be able to access it. <laughs> that's again, that's a standard uh, enterprise job out. 
annotation. So again, as with most specs, you use the microprofile config to define the externalizable behaviors. The, the JWT spec has a, a, a number of ways that you can define how you how the container um, authentic, uh, authorizes or validates the token. So the first thing you need to know is who signed it. What's the public key of the signer? And the next key piece of information is who the issuer, uh, what the issuer claim was. And so both of those things are externalized here. Uh, via this microprofile configuration information. Okay, let's try and pull all this together in a demo. So what we have is um, a number of containers, two of which are Quarkus containers. So we have two Quarkus containers that contain um, REST endpoints that are augmented with health metrics open tracing and the security API. Uh, we have another image that includes REST, health, metrics, open tracing, JWT, the um, open API, fault tolerance, and the REST client. And for not a good reason, we threw the web application front end just because I didn't want to create yet another uh, image, but normally this would also be pulled out. Those talk to a Docker-based Jager instance and a Docker-based Key Cloak instance. So this is where the the app, you know the front end is getting the token. It, well, this is where the front end signs in with the Key Cloak to get the JSON Web token, validate the user. That token comes back, and then that's used for calls over to this secured web service. These use the the REST client API to actually talk to this just public internet service that's sitting out there that you can go and curl right now. But we, you know, we, we integrated through a type safe proxy using the, the REST client interface. All right, so here's here's the front end that basically is just pulling those services together via uh, REST call. So let's let's pull that up. All right, so that is that application. What we have running here are those two demo images in Quarkus containers. This one is the, the secured one that's running in, a, um, a, in native mode. This is running in developer mode so that we can have access to the Swagger, a, the, the Swagger UI. Um, here we're not, a, we're not ashamed of the warts that exist in the native image. Native images still have edge cases that aren't handled great. So this functions, but it, it spits out a lot of garbage still. So there's still a lot of issues with cleaning this up technology-wise. Okay, so these tabs, and you, you have a link to the source code, so you can go and get this demo and build it yourself. But these tabs are basically each of the, the features that we went over. So the first one, hello, is a simple uh, JAXRS endpoint. Next one is, is uh, the configuration demo that we showed. So those are the three injected endpoints that we, we showed. The first one was just um, an injected value. Next one was pi. This one had a default to five decimals, but when we, we invoke that, we see that we're actually getting the 10 decimal version of pi that we had in the externalized configuration file. And this is the programmatic lookup. Health, so these are the health check endpoints of those two Quarkus images that we showed. So we'll start with this one. This health check is based on uh, key cloak. So this is basically going out to the key cloak instance and va validating that the realm is actually up and running. And then so what it's showing you is uh, the data that, that decided as relevant in case there was a problem. So it's showing you the, the endpoints of the token and account service, the name of the realm, and the public key of that, that realm. Okay. If we go to the, the web container health check, it's actually claiming that it's down. Why? So we look at, scroll down and look at the information that's in here. So we have a disk space. Well, okay, well that's the claim that's down. It's saying the percent free is zero, that this is a path. Path doesn't exist apparently, so that's a problem. Then we have another service check, which is up. So what you see is that the overall state of the application is the and of the individual applications. So the problem there is that I had the this configuration file came over from an iMac, which has a different home directory. So what I can do is restart the application and pass in 
an override to that microprofile config as a system property. So here I'm um, overriding the path that should be monitored for the health check. So let's just restart it. Done. Now it's up. And now if we look at the disk based check, we see that the path exists and we have um, information about the free space, user space, and percent available. Metrics, we, we had a, uh, an endpoint that has a random delay, so that, that had a, a time histogram on it. So here, every invocation of this method is invoking a method that has a, a random delay between zero and 1,000 milliseconds. So we'll just execute that a few times. Then hit the metrics page, which is the endpoint for querying the metrics. And this basically is a dump of all of the metrics. So what you see here is actually a bunch of stuff, including Jager information, you know, all kinds of stuff that aren't relevant to that method. So, but what the metrics API allows you to do is actually query for individual metrics. So this link is a query for the metric specific to that timed endpoint method. Okay, so here is basically the definition of um, a, timed, a timed metric, which is a histogram with additional information about requests. The open tracing API, um, we remember we had a customized method that shows uh, a customized information that should show up in the span information for tracing, the Jager traces. And this endpoint just again has a random delay between zero and 5,000 milliseconds in this case. And then here's a link to the, the Jager UI. So that's the, the, the Jager instance that was running in the container. Corcus MP demo is the, how we configured these traces to show up. Hello. And if we invoke that and look at the graph, what we see are the various individual traces for those methods. And this is a, a random distribution of it. These are the metrics from the timed. So they have different names. So here, that's the default name that you get is basically the HTTP name, the class name, and the operation. This was the one we customized with that annotation, how it should show up. The open API is basically providing an open API document, or in the case we're running in developer mode, integration with the Swagger UI. So when we pull this up, we're seeing the information that we define with those annotations. So all this information here is what we define with that open API document. So the, the name, the version, uh, the links to the community, it's apps, the website, the license, the external link to the Eclipse homepage, that's all information that we defined on that JaxRS application that's being shown here. Uh, there is inf we, there was also additional information in the demo that you look at, we defined additional servers. So these are the, the URLs of the two images that we're running. And here you see the difference between the tag behavior and our default behavior. So all these methods under default, this is what the, the, um, the open API extension automatically gleaned just from looking at the, the JAXRS endpoints in your application. And it is relatively detailed. So I mean, it does give you complete information about the endpoint, what its, what, what its parameters are, what, it type, what type it returns. All you don't, the only thing that you're missing is documentation like here, where we have, now we have a complete description, um, complete description. But you, you can also invoke all these methods through this, this method, so it's a really great thing to do at uh, development time. You don't have to create a little, basically you're, it, it's doing what the, the most of this does. The only thing that this front end does that they can't do is generate the, the web tokens for secured access. So the REST client, this is an example of just going directly out to that public web service via that world clock API that we defined. These two are secured, so we need to log into Keycloak. And so we've set up, um, go to user. So here we're using the OAuth flow to log into the Keycloak to generate the token. Password is this password. 
Oops, we typed it wrong. Oh shoot, go to, oops, I can't spell. Go to. So it's not fake. You gotta actually type in something. And we redirect it back to the application and then this is the token that we're assigned. So this is the access token. You know, this is the, the GWT token. i try and blow that up a little bit because it's certainly small. So the, these upper claims are your tip, your, some of your standardized stuff. There's some key cloak specific claims here. What's relevant for this demo is the zone info that we define. So CST is the, the zone info that's been assigned to this user. And then we have this groups claim, which is the roles that were assigned to this that we're going to use for role-based access decisions. Okay, now that we've logged in, and it will automatically refresh. These tokens are good for five minutes. If we go back and look at these secured endpoints, now I can invoke them. And the time that it returns is relative to the, the claim, the central time zone that the user had, or as opposed, as opposed to the, the unsecured version, which is simply returning UTC. So we're using behavior based on the token that's coming in with the claim. Fault tolerance demo just shows invocation of that method that we showed that should always time out and return the fallback answer, which it does. The JWT example. Um, has an open endpoint that requires no permission and therefore has no access to who the caller is. The secured version of that returns information from the TOGO, token, including you know, custom role checks like was that caller a member of the go to attendee role, which it was. Okay, that's, that's the demo in a nutshell. Go back to the And so the code is this link here, and the slides will be on the website, so you can get this. Don't have to write it down now. Uh, I'd like to thank Burr Sutter, Jason Green, and Sebastian Blanc for input into this talk. Remember, you can read the session. I'm happy to answer any questions. Right